Hello, and welcome to the Nutrition Diva podcast. I'm your host, Monica Reinagel. If you're a new listener, welcome. And if you're a longtime listener, thank you for tuning in and also for sharing the podcast with your friends and family. Our show today received support from Panama City Beach, Florida. Are you dreaming of a beach vacation? Get away to the sugar white sands and turquoise waters of Panama City Beach, Florida. You'll discover endless family fun, heart pounding thrills, eco adventure, and romance. So make it memorable and make it yours at Panama City Beach, the real fun beach. Plan your escape today. Visit panamacitybeach.com. Today's episode was suggested by listener James, who called into the Nutrition Diva listener line with this question. Hey, Monica, this is James. I was wondering if you could devote an episode on calories and what they are, how they're measured, and how we process them, even though they're just a measurement of food and not actual food, and uh, what a bomb calorimeter is and all the problems with counting calories. Um, So that would be awesome. (laughs) I'd love to hear that podcast. Thanks. Thanks for this great topic, James. So let's start with what a calorie is and how we know how many calories a food contains. A calorie is a unit of measure, like an inch or a kilogram, only instead of measuring length or weight, a calorie measures energy. Technically, a calorie is the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Calories can be measured using something called a bomb calorimeter. Isn't that a fun name? You might even have built a crude version of a bomb calorimeter in sixth grade science class. In broad strokes, you submerge a chamber in a bucket of water and you put a thermometer in the water. And then inside that submerged chamber, you set something on fire. The heat generated by the combustion raises the temperature of the water in the bucket, and you can measure that with the thermometer. And then you can calculate the amount of energy or calories were in the thing that you set on fire. So we used to use bomb calorimeters to calculate how many calories a given food contains. These days, however, it's much more common to estimate the number of calories based on how much protein, fat, and carbohydrate a food contains. And those amounts can be determined through chemical analysis. Now, when we're using the word calorie in relation to food, by the way, we are actually referring to kilocalories. Sometimes you'll see calories abbreviated as KCAL, and that's what that refers to. When we say that a food contains 60 calories, it really contains 60,000 calories, but all those zeros would be a pain to deal with, so we just lop them off. And believe me, this drives physicists and chemists absolutely nuts. But why do we need to know how many calories a food contains? Well, when we digest food, we don't literally set it on fire in our stomachs, but our bodies do release its stored heat or energy. And then we either use that energy to power our biological processes, or if we've taken in more energy than we need, we store it for future use. If we habitually take in more energy than we use, we gain weight. So we use calories as a guideline to determine how much food energy a person needs. We need enough to fuel growth and maintenance, but not so much that we start storing a lot of fat. There are calculators, I'm sure you've seen them, that can estimate your daily calorie needs, taking into account your age, sex, height, and activity level. And then there are databases and labels to tell you how many calories are in various foods, However, as James implies in his question, there are a few problems with this system. First of all, those calorie needs estimates can be way off. You can plug your details into an online calculator and be told that you use 1,847 calories per day. But look, you need to take that number with a truckload of salt. Energy expenditure varies hugely from person to person. Even if you and I are the exact same height, weight, age, and sex, and we do the exact same workout, you could burn 400 calories more or less than I do every day. 
And energy needs can also be affected by our diets, genetics, body composition, hormones, drugs, and a million other factors and moving targets. And just to make the whole situation just a little bit more ridiculous, those readouts on your treadmill, Peloton, FitWatch, or diet tracker that tell you how many calories you burn doing various activities are only slightly more accurate than asking the magic eight ball. But wait, there's more. Calorie counts for foods are also not as reliable as you think. Those numbers that are listed in your calorie counting app represent average values for foods. So even if you are measuring or weighing your food with great precision, well, this apple may be a little bit sweeter than average. That banana might be a little less ripe. This nut might have a little bit more fat. Even for packaged and processed foods, the calorie count that's shown on the Nutrition Facts label is just an average. A variation of plus or minus 10% of that value would not be at all surprising. Secondly, those calorie counts are estimated using formulas that may or may not be 100% reliable. It was recently discovered, for example, that the standard formulas that were in use for most of the last hundred years were overestimating the amount of energy that we humans are able to liberate from nuts. More modern methods suggest that almonds, for example, provide about 20% less energy or fewer calories than we previously thought. And finally, our bodies are not bomb calorimeters. Like a campfire that might go out and leave a few unburned chunks of wood, our bodies don't extract all the energy from our food. Some unknown and variable amount of that energy will pass through us unabsorbed. So what is the point of paying attention to calories? I'll have my answer for you right after these brief announcements from our show sponsors. I'm guessing you probably don't use a phone that was developed in the 1940s, right? But that's when the HEPA filter, long considered a benchmark in air purifying, was developed. But now Molecule has introduced a breakthrough science that goes above and beyond that standard and destroys air pollutants at a molecular level. Molecule captures and completely destroys the full spectrum of indoor air pollutants, including those 1,000 times smaller than what a HEPA filter can catch. In a study of 49 allergy sufferers presented at the American College of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology, Molecule's technology provided dramatic, statistically significant symptom reduction within one week of use. One customer even said that she was able to breathe through her nose for the first time in 15 years. For $75 off your first order, visit M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E dot Com. So that's molecule, but spelled with a K. And then enter the code DIVA at checkout. Molecule, the air that you were meant to breathe, is finally here. So if we can't really trust our calorie counters, calculators, or nutrition facts labels, then what's the point of even talking about calories? I mean, once you realize how fuzzy these numbers are, it's clear that there's really no point in counting every calorie. So how are we supposed to know how much to eat? Can we just rely on our hunger or our satiety signals to tell us if we need food and when we've had enough? Probably not. There are so many foods available that are literally engineered to override our satiety signals. And then advertising, habit, and social cues can trigger feelings of hunger even when we are not remotely in need of food. For most of us, deciding when, what, and how much to eat in the modern world requires a fair amount of prefrontal cortex activity. And here's where calorie counters might come in handy. It may be useful to know the relative energy density of foods. Even if we can't say precisely how many calories that pile of french fries contains, It is helpful to know that it contains about 10 times as many calories as the same size pile of celery sticks. And similarly, the caloric difference between a serving of berries and, say, a serving of watermelon probably doesn't matter that much in the big picture. But it is useful to understand that a bowl of fruit has only a fraction of the calories of a bowl of jelly beans. I also find it helpful to have a guide to portion sizes. For example, it would not be that hard for me to eat an entire pint of haagen ice cream. But when I see on the Nutrition Facts label that this would be about half the number of calories that I should be eating for the entire day, 
cooler heads usually prevail. Now, I'm not going to get out my kitchen scale to be sure that I eat exactly 100 grams of ice cream and no more, but I'm not going to eat the whole thing either. Now that calorie counts have been added to so many restaurant menus, I'm often surprised to see how many calories something contains. Sometimes I'm even wrong about which of several choices is higher or lower in calories. And hey, I'm a professional calorie estimator. Now, very often, seeing those numbers causes me to change my mind. That little tart might seem like a perfectly harmless little snack to enjoy with my afternoon tea until I see that it actually contains an entire meal's worth of calories. These are all valid and useful ways to use calorie information. Just keep in mind that all of these numbers, how many calories you supposedly need, how many calories various activities allegedly burn, how many calories various foods contain, all of these are really just estimates. In the end, the most reliable and accurate indicator of whether or not you're taking in the right amount of energy is what's happening on the bathroom scale, or if you prefer, in the waistband of your favorite jeans. Whatever it is that you're monitoring, keep in mind that changes from one day to the next are not due to fat loss or gain. These reflect much more transient changes in water weight and digestion. And that's why I suggest using a moving average to track your weight. And I have a whole episode on that if you're not familiar with this. But this will smooth out those meaningless ups and downs and reveal the true trend. And if your weight is trending up, or those jeans are feeling tighter and tighter every week, it's because you're taking in more calories than your body uses. But the answer isn't to start counting, weighing, and measuring every calorie, or to pledge to burn every excess calorie off through exercise, that is a ticket to crazy town. If you need to take in fewer calories, use those calorie counters as a guide to which foods might fill you up for fewer calories, or which ones need to be eaten in smaller quantities. And I have more ideas on that in my episode on how to eat less without feeling hungry, as well as my two-part episode on satiety and satiation. On the other side of the equation, look for opportunities to be more active throughout the day. My colleague, Get Fit Guy Brock Armstrong, has a great podcast on how incidental movement and not exercise is actually the key to getting fit. These strategies won't lead to fast weight loss, but trust me, you don't want them to. In our show notes for today, you'll find a transcript of this entire episode, but more importantly, you'll find links to a host of related resources on managing your weight without sweating or trying to sweat off every calorie. Just go to nutritiondiva.quickanddirtytips.com and look for episode number 520 to get your hands on all of those goodies. Do you have a question that you'd like me to answer on the podcast? Well, you can call the Nutrition Diva listener line, just like James did, at 443-961-6206. That's 443-961-6206 and leave me a message. I'd love to hear from you. But then be sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen so you don't miss your answer. The Nutrition Diva Show is written by me, Monica Reinagel, edited by Beata Santora, produced by Nathan Sems, and managed by our Quick and Dirty Tips team at Macmillan Publishing, including Michelle Margulis, Emily Miller, Morgan Ratner, and our director, Kathy Doyle. Thanks so much for listening today, and I hope you'll tune in again next week because I'm going to be digging into a topic that I know many of you are curious about, CBD oil. Don't miss it. Have a great week and eat something good for me.